Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible. We would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're investigating a key concept in time series econometrics, which is the Newey West heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation consistent standard errors, or hack standard errors, or the hack covariance matrix for short. And it has become, over the past 30 years, a go to robustness check and uh, the best practice in time series econometrics to take into account both heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation when you are estimating the standard errors for your regression coefficients. And we'll implement the hack standard errors based on a very simple and intuitive case. We'll model ExxonMobil returns over the course of three trading months from January 2022 until end of March 2022, and we'll model its relationship with the market index uh, given by S&P 500 returns and with the oil markets, given the Brent crude return. So we'll figure out which factors are significant and whether heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation make any difference for the estimation of parameter variance. First of all, we always start with the OLS coefficients, and in any robust standard errors implementation, your coefficients stay the same, but your standard errors change. So here, we are simply referring to the uh, three by one area of coefficients and using the bar matrix to get our B uh, array of estimators. So first we do the inverse matrix and then we'll plug in the matrix product of transposed X onto X. And that is just the matrix of ones and uh, the explanatory variables here. Then we multiply on the right by the non-transposed same matrix. And that's our inverse matrix done and dusted. Finally, we have to multiply it further on the right by the transposed X. And multiply it finally on the right by the vector of dependent variables Y. And that gives us three coefficients. The constant of 0.27% per day, which is the alpha of Axon Mobile, as well as its market beta, we can see how small it is, and the oil beta, which is considerably larger. That already gives us insight that over the past three months, Axon Mobile returns have been much more dependent on oil than on the overall market movements, given how prominent uh, commodity prices have been for the energy sector recently. But are these coefficients statistically significant? Well, to figure this out, we have to calculate the residuals and the covariance matrix for the estimators. For the expected values of our actual mobile returns predicted by the model we have estimated here, we can simply use the matrix multiplication function, plug in the full matrix of explanatory variables, including the constant, as well as the row of the coefficients we have just estimated. That gives us a column vector of expected uh, Exxon mobile returns. And to calculate residuals, we can subtract the predicted values from the realized, from the real world observed values, giving us an area of residuals that does sum up to zero exactly because an OLS regression is an unbiased forecasting tool. Now, to calculate the standard error of the regression, we need to figure out how many observations are there in our time series, just counting how many Axon mobile returns we've got, 62 daily returns, corresponding to three trading months, nice and easy. Then we need to take into account how many parameters we've got. Well, that's just count of our coefficient array, three coefficients we've got. And the degrees of freedom is the number of uh, observations minus the number of parameters, which gives us 59. Keeping that in mind, our standard error of the regression is the squared sum of residuals divided by the number of the degrees of freedom over here. And as it's a standard error, not variance, we can take the square root, giving us a regression standard error of 1.75%. And that's all we need to calculate the OLS, the 
uh, homoscedastic covariance matrix that we use in the a simple OLS estimation, and that's Linus, for example, or the regression tab spits in. So just to revise that, we can simply multiply the squared the standard error of the regression by the inverse matrix M inverse of the transposed X multiplied on the right by the non-transposed X. Closing the appropriate number of parentheses and inputting enter, we get our variances of parameters in the diagonal that we can quite easily convert into standard errors by taking respective square roots. And finally, as we are concerned with statistical significance, we can calculate t-stats, dividing coefficients by respective standard errors, and calculating p-values using the two-tailed t-distribution, absolute values of the t-stats, as well as the number of the degrees of freedom for the whole model that we need to lock. And here, it's quite unsurprising that the only statistically significant parameter we've got is oil, with alpha and beta insignificant, reinforcing how impactful oil has been in shaping energy stocks returns over the past several months. But is that robust to autocorrelation and heteroscedasticity? To do this particular adjustment, we have to refer to the hack procedure developed by New and West in 1987. It is a sandwich covariance estimation. However, unlike previously established sandwich estimations that are robust to heteroscedasticity, for example, Huber and White or Huber White Hinckley. We have got a tutorial on heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors, so if you're interested in that, give this video a try after this one. However, the difference that is present in the hack uh, weight matrix and in the hack covariance uh, sandwich estimation is that the weight matrix is not a diagonal matrix. It includes non-zero observations uh, away from the diagonal to reflect uh, the autocorrelation of the residuals. So to implement this, we first have to select the number of lags for the hack procedure. And well, uh, most of the time you use uh, a formula that takes the uh, optimal number of lags into account, this particular one but you can estimate hack with any number of lags whatsoever and the logic of the model does not prohibit against that any integer number of lags which is non-negative will do so let's start with one lag for simplicity here we have got to first calculate the matrix of well individual uh, covariances so the covariance matrix of residuals that would be the product of the column of residuals onto a row of residuals. And quite conveniently, we have calculated residuals already. So we can matrix multiply the column of residuals onto a row of residuals, which is the transposed column of residuals, quite intuitively. And that spits out a 62 by 62 matrix of covariances of each and every observation. That models uh, autocorrelation throughout the sample, arguably. However, to make our uh, estimator well-behaved and the matrix that we use to weigh our covariances positive and semi-definite, so we can take the uh, inverse of it and calculate the standard errors, New and West came up with this particular weighting procedure where you uh, select some integer number of flags and you weigh uh, observations that are further apart by an ever-decreasing weight. So if our lags are just one, you would uh, weigh the same observation. So for example, observation one, one, you will weigh with a factor of one and observations that are one apart. So serial autocorrelation of order one would be weighted with a coefficient of 0.5 and serial autocorrelation of higher orders, two, three, and so on, would be discarded, weighted with an order of zero. If you select the number of flags equals to two, then you would have two thirds weight for serial autocorrelation of order one, one third for serial autocorrelation of order two, and zero for higher orders, and so on and so forth. And it will be very easy to see it as we change the number of flags parameter over here and look at the weights matrix over here. So first, we have to figure out, so if the absolute value 
of the difference between observation numbers. We can model it by locking the respective rows and columns so that it stays relevant throughout the 62 by 62 matrix of weights. If this um, difference is higher than the number of lags we have established, then the weight is zero by the virtue of this procedure. However, if it's not, we have to refer to the respective variance, respective product of residuals, and times it by the new West weight over here, which is one minus the absolute value of the difference between observations over the number of lags we have established plus one. And that does the job, returning us exactly the variance for the one one observation. And if we apply it throughout, it would give us half of the value for observations one, uh, observation apart, serial autocorrelation for the one, and nothing if it's further away. So effectively, we've got a diagonal and uh, reduced values one step away from the diagonal. And it's quite easy to see it if you highlight the matrix that way. If we change our number of lags to two, for example, we would have ever decrease in observations as far as two steps away from the diagonal. If we change it to three, three steps away from the diagonal, four steps away from the diagonal, and so on and so forth. If we have got as high number of lags as 10, we would have a matrix that's quite heavily populated, but it becomes zero if the distance between observations is higher than 10. And it only makes sense, as per the new and West procedure, to take the integer number of lags. The formula would still work um, on paper for a non-integer number of lags, it just would not translate as well into the econometric meaning of the estimation. How to estimate the covariance matrix then? Kevin calculated the weights and uh, uh, all of the necessary uh, intermediary steps for the new NOS procedure. Well, we have to implement the sandwich estimation. And the sandwich estimation involves multiplying the weighted matrix of axes by inverse products uh, on the left and on the right. So to be resourceful, we can copy this M inverse function from the previous covariance matrix to not uh, waste too much time on that. So we can say M mult, refer to inverse matrix here. And this particular inverse matrix will multiply on the right by a matrix multiplication result of the transposed matrix and the weight matrix that we have estimated over here. And this is further multiplied on the right by the non-transposed X matrix, which is over here. And finally, this product needs to be multiplied on the right by the inverse product of X and X transposed. And this produces the new and west robust heteroscedisticity and autocorrelation consistent covariance matrix. The only final step that we need to undertake is to refer to the same coefficients as the coefficients do not change for robust covariance estimations and carefully refer to the diagonal of the hack matrix and take the square root to retrieve standard errors. And the t-test would not change, so we can just copy these across and see that if we take 10 lags for the new NOS procedure, the statistical significance does not change qualitatively. The oil beta is the only one statistically significant, and the constant and the market beta are still insignificant. But the statistical significance of oil is amplified. A t-stat of 6.2 becomes a t-stat of 7.4. The other uh, argument that you can make is that we have not waited for the degrees of freedom in the hack estimation, but if you would like to make your estimation more conservative, penalize it a little bit for including too many parameters, for example, you can very easily implement the degrees of freedom adjustment coefficient 
in the epsilon matrix over here, but just multiplying it on the left by the constant that's equal to t divided by t minus k. This does the job immediately, and we'll see that our standard errors would be slightly inflated due to the degree of freedom reduction. Now, t stats would be slightly less due to the same uh, concept. Well, is 10 the uh, optimal number of lags? And how to figure out the optimal number of lags? Well, the procedure that's most commonly used in statistical software is inspired by kernel theory, and it involves taking the floor or the uh, rounded down value to the nearest integer of four times t over 100 to the power of 2 over 9. This is very easy to implement. We can just calculate four times the ratio between t and 100 raised to the power of 2 over 9. And this we need to round down to the nearest integer, so to zero digits. And that would say that the optimal number of lags is 3. So let's go for 3 lags. And we'll see that the results change accordingly, but they do not change materially. And that's a very easy implementation of heteroscedisticity and autocollation consistent uh, New West robust covariance matrix in Excel for any time series regression of your choice. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I may go see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics I would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, consider supporters on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.